Uh, you've got 1,200 headcount turnover of, I think it was it, 58 million, mashallah, 2 million users, which in a country of Tajikistan's size of 10 million, that's a pretty sizable amount of people. Building a bank requires $10 million in equity in Tajikistan at that time, but it also requires a lot of you know, input. So that you cannot do business in countries like Tajikistan unless you're willing to, to go along with corruption. And that's not the case. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm Ibrahim Khan. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're sat here with a very, very special entrepreneur all the way from Tajikistan, although these days you're here locally. Oh, yeah. um, Abdullah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Barakallah, fi barakallah, salam. Alhamdulillah, you've achieved so much in your life. Uh, you've built Alif Bank, which many of us historically have never heard of. Many of our audience will never have heard of. And yet this is an absolute juggernaut in uh, Tajikistan in that Central Eastern European area, right? Uh, you've got 1,200 headcount turnover of, I think was it, 58 million, mashallah, 2 million users, which in a country of Tajikistan's size of 10 million, that's a pretty sizable amount of people. Um, tell us your story. Like, how, how, how did this all happen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram. You're very kind. Um, so my background uh, professionally, I started here in the UK. Indeed, I started from investment banking. I then moved to Mongolia, did private equity there in metals and mining sector. And then around 12 years ago, I went back to Tajikistan. Um, and Tajikistan is indeed a very beautiful country, very, you know, we have beautiful lakes and mountains. And, and uh, I'd love uh, some of your views to, to Google and, and maybe to go there, to travel there to Tajikistan for sure. Went back, uh, I started working in the finance industry. And what I saw was that the finance industry in general was slightly back uh, at that time, uh, the non-performing loan ratios were high, the simple payments, it would take a lot of time, you would have to go to a bank and stand in a queue to make a simple utility bill payment, for example, or transferring someone money, you would have to take a cab or, or just, you know, take a transport, go see them in person. So we wanted to try to change the situation and uh, we wanted to establish the first Islamic bank in Tajikistan that and how technology driven. And Back then I was 26, 27 right. roughly, and um, you know, the second mid of 20s. But yeah, being, being young, uh, 20 something, uh, we couldn't convince any investors because you know, building a bank requires $10 million in equity in Tajikistan at that time, but it wow. also requires a lot of you know, input. So we couldn't convince anyone to, to put money into that proposition. So we started ourselves with my co-founders. And, and what made you go back to Tajikistan? Because you, you yeah. doing, I think you had a decent job in the city here, right, in London. I, yeah, I, 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 I always wanted to go back. I mean, it has never been under question for me. So my time that I was outside of Tajikistan learning, working, etc., it was all to prepare myself to go back. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it was, it was a great journey. And as I was saying, when we couldn't convince anyone to invest with us, uh, with my uh, co-founders, Firdaus Mirzoev, Zulshor Rahmatloyev, and an angel investor, we started Alif as a small microfinance institution uh, with Islamic principles in mind. And uh, Alhamdulillah, in the next nine and a half, now soon to be 10 years, we had a, a, an amazing journey. We today have, as you rightly mentioned, 2 million customers, 1,200 employees. We have leading market share, about 90% of point of sales finance market, 55% of digital payments market, more than 60% of mobile outbound remittances market. We're leaders in e-commerce. We're leaders in visa payments. We are when we signed strategic, we signed strategic partnership with Visa International, and back then we were the last bank to. We, there, there were about nine other banks in, in in that already had Visa cards. But when we joined within a year, we were able after you know after offering our Visa cards to get 50% market share in Visa payments in in Visa cards in the country. Now, alhamdulillah, we have also been able to grow to a neighboring country, Uzbekistan, and build a leadership position in point of sales finance there with roughly 33% market share, according to our estimates. And we built our entire technology stack in-house, our own core banking solution, payment solutions, mobile app, everything with one of the strongest IT teams in that part of the world, about 200 developers. And our vision, Ibrahim, inshallah, is to build a global champion in Islamic fintech. Because we believe that this is an area that needs more effort, more, more people focusing on it, more entrepreneurs focusing on it. Because when you look about, there's, there are 
billion unbanked people in the world. And whereas Muslims make 25% of the world population, they make roughly 50% of unbanked population of the world. And there are so many things that can be done to help solve that problem. And oh, oh, why is it bad to be unbanked? It's just like mentioning the example of Tajikistan, when you have to put so many expenses to transfer somewhere money, when you have to leave your children at home and go pay for your electricity bill like my mother did. Mm. And when all of that changes and you can do it at a press of a button, the quality of your life improves so much. You can, you know, it now my mother does it. Well, it, she, she still wants to do it, but she does it in a couple seconds. It, she literally just puts the number of our, you know, utility bill and everything is integrated. She sees how much we need to pay. Just press a button and, and it's paid. No longer waiting in queues, no hours wasted on commute, etc. And uh, so, Abdullah, I wanted to go back to um, the first six months, the first year. What do you do? Like, how, how did this whole thing, you know, get started? The first six months in the year, you do everything by yourself, of course, right? So, um, and there's only three of you at the start? Or there... Yeah, so it was in the office, the full-time people were Zuhur Shaw and myself. And we had uh, Firdaus, our third co-founder, back then he was part-time. And uh, we had a, also a, a, an accountant uh, also who was part-time. But uh, we did, of course, everything uh, as you would expect, uh, everything ourselves. And, and because there's no deep support infrastructure that there is in the UK, for example, everything in terms of marketing, accounting, cashier, everything is in-house. You have to, so we did our own designs. We would go distribute flyers. We would, you know, uh, of course, serve the customers, uh, do the cashiers, you know, related work. And, and A to Z, everything was was done. And you didn't have an app at this point? No, no. Initially, we weren't quite technological. Uh, to be honest, initially, everything was on Excel, actually. So well, our first call banking system was... <laughs> in Excel, our first 2,000 customers were served by uh, Excel and, and, and the VBA macros and all that. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, thankfully, we have been very fortunate with the team that joined over time with, to Alif uh, and, and uh, you know, people like um, Shorukh and Mustafa and Zarina and Habib and uh, Dilawar and, and Daler and so many others who were able to build all the technology. The best decision I remember once we made was initially, Ibrahim, initially we started by saying we will focus on service and we'll outsource technology. So we tried outsourcing our core banking system once. It didn't work. Within a month, they said that they couldn't make the changes that we needed because our products had to be Sharia compliant and not all core banking systems are mm. designed in a way that at the core, you know, the interest and everything else has to be taken out and it has to be different, right? So it didn't work out with the first vendor. We tried the second vendor. It didn't work out again. And then one day, one of our, one of our team members, Zarina, um, uh, she's still with us and she, she's in Ayan as well, by the way. She came and said, uh, Abdullah, trust us. We can build this in-house. And, and uh, that was one of the best decisions we made. We built the core banking system in-house. We started writing it. Afterwards, we wrote other systems and... We, we start when, and we started getting more IT people coming in because we had these challenging propositions. And as we had doing more of that, we, we were able, because good people attract good people. So as those amazing people joined Alif, Alhamdulillah, we've been able to get better kind. So today, until now, we had 100,000 applicants that have applied to work in Alif and we're able to take the best, you know, one to two percent to join the team. And, and so, Abdullah, in that... Um... For, so at the end of the first year, what? how many people did you have in the team, roughly? I think it was about five, maybe, at the end of the first year. Okay. So it was quite, it was quite like a slow ramp up. Absolutely. And then, and then when, when, when did you, you know, feel that, you know, this is actually really working? I've not, you know, thrown my life away for this, you know, wrong endeavor. I think with Alif, alhamdulillah, we were profitable from year one. And it was, you know, in terms of, uh, we, are, you know, we we were still profitable. We've been profitable from year one, and and we've been growing at two to three times every year. Uh, and uh, in the in the first year, it was clear that we're getting traction. We initially were trying to be agnostic in terms of the sectors we would target, but over time we realized that uh, you know the sector that is most needing of service was, was retail sector because it was easier for the banks to serve big customers because you do your due diligence once and you know you, you provide a big check and then you don't have to put a lot of technology into that. Yeah. 
But when it comes to working with retail customers, when you want to do hundreds of thousands of transactions per day or per month, then you have to put a lot of emphasis into the technology. And, and that's where we found to be our niche. So over time, we start focusing in, in that direction. And uh, initially, what were you doing? Because Alif Bank now does a whole bunch of things, right? Uh, initially, what was the you know, what was the niche? What was the focus? The initial focus was on providing financing. So we started with finance. And by the way, just like we're doing at the moment here in the UK, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But our first target was we have to build a business which generates revenue, which, gen which can cover its own expenses, even if, you know, we have lower expenses, but we have to be able to bootstrap ourselves because that uh, in, in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, in that part of the world, funding, especially then, now it's getting better, but funding for startups, it's very challenging. It's, you know, almost in existence. So you have to work, you have to do your best to, to always bootstrap yourself and, and bootstrap your growth. Um, and that's why we started with providing financing that generated revenue. With that, we then focused on uh, payment technologies. On, on We launched Alif Mobi after a couple of years. That was for payments. And then we launched our Alif Shop, our e-commerce app that was for you know, helping merchants and helping buyers to make the best decisions. And, and with all that payment infrastructure, e-commerce, et cetera, we were able to build an ecosystem that there is here there today. And I can talk more about what sort of that ecosystem includes. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So how, how does the ecosystem work? So today, um, within Alif Mobi, you've pretty much everything that you may want to do with your wallet, with your money. Uh, you can do your deposits, your borrowing, your uh, transfers, your international payments, your domestic payments. You can purchase things. It's integrated with our e-commerce platform. And all of that is within a single app. And today we do roughly 170,000 financing transactions per month and of that 80 percent is done through the app it's all automated it's very fast today about 70 percent in uzbekistan in particular 70 percent of all decisions about whether to provide financing or not is done through machine learning and ai uh, we called it gunshitai by the way gunshitai is a, is a traditional name of in, in in our part of the world and and gunshitai makes all those decisions uh gunshitai responds to two-thirds of all customer inquiries from start to end and she has 90% accuracy rate. And the other one third is also done in combination with Gulstai and, and a human operator. So um, today it's in, in the long term, we want everything from tickets, from ordering food, from, you know, your daily banking, all to be within within Alif Mobi. And, and we've done, you know, Alhamdulillah, we've, we've gone quite a way to, to that. And, and do you think um, that it was... Um partly because i suppose it was the right time and the right place as well right because you've got this emergence of uh technology fintech um the world is opening up a little bit as yep. well which makes it possible for you um and at the same time it does come down to execution as well right yeah. so how how would you divide it up in terms of you know the uh, the success of alif uh, when you weigh up those two things. Say again, so in terms of the... No, close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's the idea that, okay, Alif Bank was successful because um, we just, we did executed really well or the team was really good or Alif Bank was successful because um, just the, the big secular trends were with us and, and digitization was happening and it was inevitable. It was gonna, we, we were just right, the right time, right place kind of thing. I think it's both. I mean, you... Quite often, it is both because uh, you couldn't do a super app when, you know, with the mobile phones weren't there, right? So the infrastructure had to be ready for us to be able to implement our strategy. Uh, but also if the team wasn't there, uh, if the right people, I can spend hours talking about our team, uh, then again, we wouldn't, able, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. So um, yeah, absolutely. There was a lot of elements that helped us, but also there were a lot of challenges that we uh, had to overcome and we really enjoyed the process. For example, one of the challenges we had is that uh, the, again, we were, we were spending more and more time on technological financial services. So we had to have a lot of good developers. Now, again, we were fortunate. Uh, I've mentioned, you know, Habib and Abu uh, Qahor and Safo and Shorukh and many others that initially joined Alif and then they brought more people in, but it was the, the, the country is small, so there weren't that many people left. So we, and, and we had to train our own developers. The universities at that time, 
um, they were focusing on older technologies and the graduates were not yet ready to, to work with, with the new technology. So uh, we, we established Alif Academy uh, early on in, in the life of Alif and we started providing free programming courses. Uh, and a lot of that was digital, some of that was in class. And by now we have trained 2,500 students for free how to program. We do special, you know, we do programming courses for girls, for children, for Afghan refugees. Today we're working with universities, with top three universities in Tajikistan to provide programming courses. And, and, and that helped us a lot. And we are now doing the same in Uzbekistan. So Alif, in essence, is about three main things, Ibrahim. So it's about technology, it's about people, it's about education. Uh, and those are the three main things that, that are driving Alif. So Abdullah, I'd love to hear a bit more about uh... You know, you painting a picture of what it's like to operate a business in Tajikistan. Like what's different about it? Because we know what it feels like mm. to operate a business in the UK. Um, indeed, you're doing it at the moment, right, with your new venture. Um, yeah, how, how is it like? Of course, yeah. Um, so now that I'm starting something here in the UK uh, with, with my co-founders, I, I can see some differences. The, on, on the first thing that I already mentioned is that there's a lot of supporting infrastructure in the UK. So a lot of things can be outsourced. You can outsource accounting, you can outsource HR, you can outsource marketing and, and lots of things within the UK can be done. In, in Tajikistan, on the other hand, a lot of things are in-house. So we, have, we had to have our own, uh, pe you know, customer service was in-house, had to be in-house, of course. We call people, that we, that's one of the, our largest teams still in Tajikistan where we answer phone calls, we, we, we make phone calls. The, the IT team had, was, had to be in-house. Uh, the marketing team, I was, I was just men mentioning to Kabir, we have about 50 people in our marketing team, amazing, beautiful individuals. And, and we, went, we decided that we focus on bringing in young, driven, energetic team members into Alif and we'll train them ourselves. So the average age of our employees to this day is about 25. A lot of them, they come into Alif we, so when we hire, we hire for character, for the, as we said, fire in the eye, like, you know, the, the motivation to do things. And, and then when it comes to specific skills, we, we focus on teaching those specific skills in-house. And, and Alhamdulillah, that's, um, that's one of the blessings of working in, in, in Tajikistan. So that's the, some of the things, right? Um, on the other hand, in, 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 in the UK, you try to focus on a specific niche, or at least that's how you start in Tajikistan. Therefore, given those challenges, inevitably you build an ecosystem that I was talking mm. about. So inevitably you do a lot of things, right? So it's, that's another difference. And finally, in, in Tajikistan, the market is much smaller than the UK. So that has its own uh, differences. There's much more competition here. There's less competition in, in countries like Tajikistan and other emerging countries. And uh, what's the whole um, uh, legal system like? You know, is there corruption? What's what's that side of things like? Um, that's a good question. Um, I also don't want to get you in trouble, but <laughs> no, no, that's a really good question, Ibrahim. And there is a there is a misconception that you cannot do business in countries like Tajikistan unless you're willing to, to go along with corruption. And that's not the case. Alif has never paid a single penny in terms of any bribes or anything like that, never. And we want to show that it is possible to do business in emerging markets, including in Tajikistan, by doing everything by the book. Because if you follow the rules and the law, there's nothing that anyone can come and say, can, can leverage against you and then go down the wrong route, right? So, and I'm sure there are many examples that one can speak of. So Abdullah, um, I want to uh, use your experience as an entrepreneur now. And by the way, um, you, you know, you've set up the largest website that's used in Tajikistan at the moment, which is this, uh, like a, almost like auto trader, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's closer to Gumtree in, in, in what it does. Right. Like there, are, it's, it's everything, cars, rent, jobs, everything. Yeah. Mad. So you so you've got the so you've got that going on. That's your side hustle, is it? Alongside a lift bank. Well, actually, it's it's. Um, I've been again fortunate uh, with people who are on someone TJ because I actually don't do pretty much anything on someone TJ. We we started it. I'm a co-founder, but with my co-founders uh, Diloar and Jahangir, and 
We started it in 2012, and then um, pretty soon we were able to bring investors and 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 you know the team that is there today, uh, Maggie and others. They're just carrying on. They're they're running the business, and it's it's one of those areas where as soon as you reach the a certain threshold, a certain minimal threshold, then you just keep growing because it's a network effect. And the more people put their advertisements, their, their ads, their announcements on your website, the more people come in to your website and vice versa, and it just fits into itself. And it's very hard to compete against that. But we had a, a moment in time, there was a competition. So uh, it was a, a, another company, an Ukrainian company, if, if I'm not mistaken, that was uh, building a website called Lala4 in Tajikistan, Lala4 TJ. So everywhere you went, you heard this, Somon TJ, Lala4 TJ, Somon TJ. So everywhere there was marketing because it was a breaking point. It's mm-hmm. either this or that. So if, if, if we had lost back then, there would, no, there would be no, 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 someone teach it. It's, uh, and this is a market in, in classifieds. It's, it's a market where kind of winner takes all. And, uh, and so the question I had for you, Abdullah, is as an experienced entrepreneur in different areas, um, you're, uh, and for new entrepreneurs, someone who wants to start up their business for the first time, what's your, you've got a blank piece of paper, what's the game plan? What's your advice to them? Uh, there, I, I, I'm, I doubt I can add anything to, to so many uh, things that uh, are all already on your platform that you have advised. Um, I think the faster you can get to meet your clients, like whatever that fastest route is, that, that's probably a, another common lo- knowledge, but uh, that's what we have done. We've um, chosen in the UK and 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 and, I, and I'm I'm sure we're gonna move to the UK shortly. But we've chosen a certain sector in the UK, because even though our long-term vision is to build an Islamic bank, inshallah, we've chosen an area where we can start fastest. Uh, and I hope that within the next couple uh, days and, and weeks, we we're, we're already interacting with our customers. So so we're 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 about to launch fully in terms of the product and. And and it's we're already speaking to customers, so we are we've been able to do that in a matter of we started around we established Ayan in September, so it's 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 you know relatively short period of time that uh, gives us ability to talk to customers on a fully sort of ready platform. So that would be the the key I think advice because once you start speaking to your customers, a lot of the assumptions you have you start actually ensuring whether your assumptions and hypotheses were correct. So um, could you give an uh, give us an example of one of those things where you thought it was something, it turned out to be something completely different. Yeah. Um, again, I, if I were to, to do with Alif, for example, uh, we initially were agnostic. We were, uh, we, our first financing was car finance, then we did mortgage, then we did business finance, then we did retail finance, and we started analyzing. And after a certain time, a, a trend appeared. The trend was that the smaller the size of the financing, the lower the non-performing uh, ratios on those financings. So we strategically shifted the organization to focus on small financings to be uh, to benefit from lower non-performing loans, but also because it's technological and it fitted everything together. So initially, we kept it agnostic, and and then we decided to focus. So we we had those client interactions. We saw how things could be in practice. Another one is uh, many you know examples from from other ventures that failed <laughs> that I can give, but. Uh, uh, the, we we tried along with someone TJ, we tried a another uh, classified just specifically for cars, and and there was a specific car related classified, and we had someone TJ was general, and we saw that it actually doesn't make sense to have that one, so we focused on that, and and, and there are a lot of pivots when it comes to you know any pretty much any business. And uh, what do you think of this? Um, you know the biggest mistakes that you've made. Uh, over the last decade or like and what what are the lessons you've learned from it the biggest mistakes good one um i have to think about this um biggest mistakes give me an idea what were your biggest mistakes ibrahim um so I, I, i'll need to think about it now <laughs> <laughs> um so i think uh i guess from a business perspective focusing down um i think we could have done it quicker um I think that would be probably one of the important ones. Focusing on a specific area. Yeah, specific product. Um, I think uh, technology-wise, I think we could have matured a little bit faster mm. uh, by hiring in uh, people in tech a bit yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, and and I think, yeah, possibly even around the growth and content side, I think we could have 
uh, I think we could have been a little bit more pur- purposeful mm-hmm. about our goals and ra- rather than being a bit a bit scattergun, just being quite focused on, all right, this is the medium, this is what we're going to go after kind yeah. of thing. Interesting, interesting, amazing. Now, in, in, in our case, Ibrahim, I think for us, it took a while to draw the vector of growth. To It took a while for us to say, let's aim for a global Islamic fintech proposition. And therefore, it took us a long time to rebuild our technologies around that. So the first time we wrote our Alif Mobi Super App, for example, it was a lot of, you know, it was for Tajikistan. It wasn't built to scale to other countries. It wasn't multi-user, multi-tenant, multi-language. So when we expanded to Uzbekistan, we had to rewrite it. And 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 when we rewrote it, we we also now started to think, okay, in the long run, we should put as much as possible to the cloud. So we wrote it, this time we wrote it in a way which would be cloud native and actually a, a hybrid because a lot of countries have requirement to keep some certain data in the country. The next time, actually, you know, it was like several layers, but uh, uh, the latest version is written in a way which can scale to any country at this stage, right? So making that decision took us many, many, many years uh, and, and switching to that decision took, took a long time. But um, um, other than that, every failure we had, Ibrahim, when I look back, I feel like, wow, actually it was, it was great. It, it, if it wasn't for that failure, we would have ended up in, in a different, totally different area. Like the fact that two, the example I just mentioned without sort of even even going to other examples, the, the, the two first times that we failed to implement a outside core banking system prompted us to write our own. That Those were failures in, 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 in that respect, but, but it made us a technology company. So, um, so a lot of times when I look at the failures, I always have this feeling that it, it must be for our benefit because it, we believe as long as you work with pure intentions, as long as you, you, you want to do, you bring value to people and, and you do your best, you work hard, whatever happens is 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 for the for the best. Yeah, no the higher. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Abdul, I want to ask a little bit about how you manage uh, teams and how that's evolved over time because I can only imagine, right, what it must be to have to manage 1,200 people uh, I think IFG is roughly around 30 people at the moment. So it's, uh, when I feel like sometimes that gets a little bit, you know, larger than manageable. Um, so how how did you approach that problem? I think, Ibrahim, so sort of two elements to that. First of all, people, and secondly, culture. And in terms of people, it's who you bring in is very important. There, there, there's a very famous author, um, uh, author of the book uh, Built to Last, Good to Great. In in one of the books, it says that first bring in the right people into the bus and then decide where you want to go, right? So the team is, of course, even more important than what you really want to do because if you bring in the right people, you'll figure things out along the way. And, um, and being very, very meticulous in the hiring process and focusing on the personal qualities of integrity, honesty, hard work, enthusiasm, that inner motivation, what does the person want in life is so much more important than certain hard skills. You surely want to make sure the hard skills are there, but the primary factors have to be their inner person, you know, inner, inner self, their inner core that, that they've built on. And and that's why, you know, uh, in, in Alif, we had like almost, you know, five to eight stages in recruitment. You know, some people keep coming in and in and it's like, does it, does it finish? <laughs> so, um, but, but thankfully, uh, that's been really, you know, we, 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 we have been fortunate really with the people we have. And the second element is the culture that unites those people and helps them actually play as a team much more effectively because you've got, even in, in many uh, of professional sports, you've got team which could be medium so, uh, per peep, you know, in terms of their skills, they might be less than uh, the yeah. skills of other teams, but if they work better together, they win, right? And and that the culture that unites the, the team uh, is very important. And, and in Alif, we wrote down our culture, our key values, uh, in, 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 and actually we implement them. We, we want 
it to be implemented by everyone. It's and it's the things that you you would want, you would expect in in a financial institution with that level of responsibility to have. So integrity is always number one. To be straight like Alif, because Alif is written like a straight line, is at the core. Be straight like Alif. No matter what happens, no matter what's at stake, always do the right thing. Tell the truth. Always be honest. And that's the number one. And second is take ownership of Alif. Alif is yours. Is what we always tell our team and and everyone knows that they're expected to take ownership to do they they everyone can take their own initiative to to do new products to to provide a different customer service when we had an unhappy client someone would just go and take a flower to their house without asking from anyone any permissions they know that they can do more than it's expected from them they mm. do that initiative and we tell those stories inside i believe that this you know just do what you feel is right take ownership and actually we give ownership alif has the largest one of the largest probably in the world in terms of esop package about 25% of the company is dedicated to the team to the, today about 300 of our employees are shareholders of alif the largest number of people in in alif shareholder ca- you know if you by number of people is is all the team and and you know once all that esop package is implemented the majority of the shareholders by 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 by, by total sort of ownership will be the employees and 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 the founders and um, similar cultural elements like not being indifferent to each other. So in in Tajikistan, we have a lot of we have very strong greeting culture. So when we come in, we say salam alaikum, we greet each other, we hug each other, and we encourage people. Actually, when you come into office, you know, even if it's like fifty people in in there, just go and say hi. You know, do do your salam, and and when you're leaving, say goodbye. Those small corners, you know, like cornerstone habits, as it, as, yeah, as it yeah. were, that we. People, we encourage people to have choosing the right people and empowering them with the right culture. And do you still, like, how many people do you have reporting into you? I mean, I guess you're slightly at one removed now, but how many people? Um, when I was uh, in Tajikistan, when I was the CEO of the bank, I had about 12, 15 people reporting roughly. Um, but anyone had access of and course. anyone always has access to, to our, lit- you know, there's no you know, the, the, there's no door that can't be open to anyone in Alif. Everyone has access to each other. Today in Alif Bank, uh, the CEO is Gulanor, uh, and the leadership team it consists of three people, Gulanor and Diluar and Taler. And, and they are, one of the most important things is they always are approachable by anyone. They ask feedback. So one of the things we always do is we, we really ask p- feedback from people. So we had this feedback day when we gave candy to people who came and told me when I was the CEO, something that was wrong with something, like if we were doing the wrong, uh, the product had something to be fixed, etc. So we encourage people to come and say something that is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be pleased to hear. Mm-hmm. And we encourage people to open up, to tell us what's wrong, right? And this, the leadership in Alif today, in, in Alif Bank in Tajikistan, still has the same, and that, that's why they are the leaders. They, they are open to everyone. Um, and, and that feedback culture is, is very strong in Alif. And similarly in Alif Uzbekistan, where Nuruddin is the uh, head of uh, the team. So feedback culture really helps us to hear whatever is happening, to always know immediately if something needs to be fixed. And Abdullah, how do you think about moving uh, now, I guess, to your expansion phase, uh, internationalization? Because you guys were at a certain point looking at where to expand to, yeah. right? So how how did you approach that journey and how where did you land? So I think the way we approached it, uh, Ibrahim, was uh, in our case uh, uh, maybe slightly different to, to the way it's probably usually approached. We didn't go and buy an established company. We didn't, let's say, send uh, someone to do that. We actually did it ourselves. So the three of us as co-founders, we, 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 we said that we have to build Alif in a way which where everyone can continue growing. So to continue to create those, that growth opportunity, we have to build the culture, the technology, everything to scale globally. And we have to be the ones who go and take the risk and, and enter new markets and, and fail and stand up again and try something else again and, and until it works. And Alif, alhamdulillah, in, in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan has been built that way. So the leaders which are with us, in terms of our overall leadership team, Ibrahim, we, 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 alhamdulillah, we have had zero churn. Like everyone that has started with Alif, they're, they're among the top management team is still with Alif. Best team on the ground, and we can go and take the risks where we need to make quick on-the-spot decisions, where we need to uh, take the failure risk ourselves. And and therefore, we decided that um, Zuhusha would focus on the Gulf, 
what we can do in the Gulf region. And in the Gulf region, we're trying to help the underserved blue collar market in the Gulf region. While there are a lot of fintechs, a lot of financial institutions, they focus on the white collar segment, on high net worth, etc. And blue collar workers, they are considerably underserved. They're paying high fees. They, they don't have enough banking products and they don't have enough financial uh, inclusion. And that's what we want to try to focus on in, in the Gulf region. Firdaus Mirzoev is focusing on Pakistan. In Pakistan, again, there is huge, you know, 220 million population. There's a lot that can be done in the financial sector because unfortunately, for a number of reasons, the access to credit has been very difficult there. Um, according to some reports, less than 1% of population has access to financing. We feel like if we can bring value to countries where uh, an Islamic finance proposition may help financially include uh, large parts of the population, then we should at least attempt and try and, and, and go there. And with myself, I wanted to, for us, for Alif, to focus on something that can expand us to the Western world. And um, I've, I chose the UK because I believe the UK has massive potential, uh, as it is the hub for Islamic finance in the West. It has the largest Islamic finance assets in the West. It has the largest support infrastructure, etc. So that's why I, um, to be able to build a truly global Islamic fintech, we, we, we thought we cover, you know, the right areas. That's really exciting. And, uh, and so, um, each of you are kind of, uh, in a way you're venturing out on your own, right? And you're, you're, ha you're having to build out teams afresh. Yeah. Um, uh, but like, are you, so I have uh, Firdaus and Zorosho, have they moved to Pakistan and so at least in, in case of Zorosho, he moved to the UAE to, 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 he's currently in Dubai. In case of uh, Firdaus, he, he almost doesn't have to move because it's, it's very close taking flights, etc. but also like it's the same time zone with great team on the ground in Pakistan. Um, and, 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 uh, yeah, I've, and I've moved to the UK. Um, so yeah, uh, moving a lot of time really helps because you need to be in the, in, you know, you need to, to see really, you know, to, to feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, uh, Abdullah, what are you, uh, what are you up to in the UK? Yeah. So, so, um, in terms of the UK, as I was saying, I, I believe there's a lot that can be done in the financial space here. I was sharing earlier uh, with Khidr that. Uh, despite the fact that there's this huge support infrastructure for Islamic finance and there are a number of Islamic banks, there's no single bank where you could do your financing, your deposit, your day-to-day -day banking, a, a, a fintechy, a, a user-friendly app that covers all of that. And I think that can be, that's something again that, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs can, can try to uh, focus on and that's where we want to focus on. And we wanted to start where we can start the fastest because building a bank of course it's a process that takes several years so where we decided to start and we looked into the uh car finance market and there's a certain niche a particular niche the private hire vehicles who drive with uber with bolt with uh edison lee with uh free now with uh black lane and others the majority of private hire vehicle and taxi drivers they come from muslim background and they're significantly underserved today where there's a massive push to move from traditional petrol and diesel cars towards electric vehicles with all the advantages that they get this transformation is not happening fast enough because one of the reasons there are a number of reasons but one of the reasons there's no fi islamic financial institution that would finance the purchase of electric vehicles which are expensive so that's the area we decided to focus on and and this area in particular allows us to be able to start as soon as possible so we are pretty much ready to start right now. And uh, as we proceed with this, inshallah, the goal is to expand to other uh, financial services in the UK and it hopefully at some point to apply for the banking license. This venture in particular, Ayan Capital, in the UK we are Ayan Capital, it is separate from Alif. Because with Alif, as we were expanding rapidly, um, there was a, 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 a time when the board was concerned that we're doing too many things mm. at the same time and in terms of mostly in terms of financial risks there was that concern that, and and we said okay let's with, with the permission of the board let's do the uk financially we'll do it with Firdaus and with zulsho ourselves separately if things work out we can see how you know potentially in the future we we might even merge 
Um, so we took the risks ourselves here in the UK and uh, we're building the technology, etc. also from start, but we have the support of Alif infrastructure. So we have uh, the support, both moral support and, and technological support. Whenever we need, we can, you know, have that have support. What can people expect from you, from Alif, from Ayan over the next few years? Amazing. So inshallah, from Ayan, uh, we hope we would be able to serve at least 3,000 private hire vehicle drivers in the next two years. I uh, hope, hope that we can do that. And I think it's doable because if you even just look at Uber and roughly with 40,000 cars that need to move from you know, traditional to, to electric, I think 3,000 is, is, is a target that we could achieve. And from there, hopefully, we would also expand to other services, to deposits, payments, etc. As I speak to people here, I see a lot of even the, the, the same target audience, the Uber drivers and, and Bolt drivers, they keep their savings at 0%. They call their bank, they write to their bank, and that's what I did as well. I wrote to my bank to, to ask them to move their deposits to 0% account. And this is at a, at a time when, you know, they, they're living so much on the table because the traditional sort of interest, the traditional deposits, they're paying very good rates. And there's a lot that, you know, a lot of benefit. If, 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 if that was, be, you know, if a financial uh, institution with Islamic deposits was able to give them those benefits quickly, easily, with with everything else around it as well, with day-to-day -day banking, they would have been much better off. So hopefully that's something we can build over time here in the UK. The Gulf and Pakistan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, our goal is to work towards, we are considering the next round of financing at the moment. Most likely it would be a, uh, a larger round uh, compared to our last round significantly uh, to, to build on our leadership in, in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan to continue building this super app and ecosystem to support our growth in Pakistan and the UAE, inshallah. And Abdullah, we're going to see more of each other anywhere, right? Because we're working together on this, uh, uh, on the Ayan Capital uh, fundraise yeah. on the Curate Capital platform. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be interesting for investors. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Thank you so much. And uh, looking forward very much to, you know, taking this forward. Barakallah, Fiq. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. <laughs>